Um, and if you guys have any questions, just put them in the chat. Once I'm done with the normal lecture, we can just open the mics up and ask questions also if you guys need to. Um, so tonight we're talking about files. And um, let's do this. So files are data storage. That's what we do. Everything we have done up until this point in the class has been in memory. It's been in RAM, which means that the data is available while the program is running. And once the program stops running, then the data goes away. And we don't like that. That's not how, how things work. You know, when we think about um, doing a search in Google, that data is on a, in a database somewhere. And a database is just a big file with a lot of software around it. Um, so, so we need to learn how to manage files. It's an essential part of being a program. It's an essential part of understanding how to program. Doesn't matter the language. You have to understand how to save files, read files, do all kinds of things with files. So that's what we're talking about now. So we're extending how we use a program. Up until now, we've used it where we've gotten user input. We've done some calculations, the program goes away, and the user input goes away. This week, things don't necessarily go away. They stick around in files. So what's a file? On a computer system, a file is just about everything. Python, the executable that is Python, is in fact a file. Everything Microsoft is a file, a browser is a file. Our PyCharm files are files. So when you're talking about a computer system, you really are talking about files. Some of them we have to open up and do things with. And well, kind of pretty much all of them we have to open up and do things with. I mean, executing Microsoft Office or Microsoft Word is in fact opening up a file and doing something with it. It's just that the operating system is doing that for us. So what can I do with a file? You guessed it, CRUD, Create, Read, Update, Delete. Very similar to our other lists and dictionaries. When we talk about CRUD, we're talking about how do we create it, how do we access it, how do we change it, and then how do we remove it? We won't really talk a lot about removing files because we don't really need to do that and that's more of an operating system thing, but you can delete files in Python. Um, so let's talk about, we're going to spend a lot of tonight talking about creating, reading, and updating. Those are the three big ones. Deleting is just pretty much a standard action. You get a file to the pointer, you tell the operating system, delete this file. And it does. OK, files and operating system. Every operating system handles files differently. Mac handles them somewhat differently than Linux, not completely. Uh, Windows handles them different from any other operating system. And um, every time you do an action on a file, you are required to, act, to do something with the operating system because that's what you're doing. You're telling the operating system, go do this to this given file. Um, so, and Python is great because what it does is it takes, it puts a layer on top of the operating system. I don't have to worry about actually telling the operating system what to do. I tell Python what to do, and Python translates that, translates that for me into what the operating system does. Why is that important? That is important because I don't want to have to rewrite my code if I want it to run on a Windows and I want it to run on a Linux system. I want it to run on any system, and it's called write once, uh, write once, run many. Um, Java is like that. Python is like that. Languages like C and C++ are not like that because 
they're closer to the operating system than Python or Java is. Python and Java are meant to abstract the operating system so you don't have to worry about it. C and C++ are not meant to abstract the operating system. So you do have to worry about it. You have to worry about the direction of the slashes. You have to worry about um, how that particular operating system handles it. Can you run things that are in C and C++ on a Windows system? Sure, why not? But you have to handle um, file operations differently based on the different operating systems. However, in Python you don't. And that makes Python a very powerful tool because I can take it, I can write it on a Windows machine and run it on a Linux machine or run it on a Mac. And that may not seem big right now, but it's huge in the computer world. The less code I have to write, the more places I can run it, the, the um, lower cost it is for me to create that computer program. Okay, so what's a file? Well, a file has some properties. And what I mean by properties are just the data about the file, because files don't just kind of exist like in a cloud hanging around. The operating system and Python have to know information about the file to do things with the file. The first thing is the name. All files have a unique name on the system. Now that unique name may does include the fully qualified path, so the directory to get to that file. It um, the, one of the properties is the size of the file. How big is it? Now, right now, with the examples we're doing, the size of the file doesn't make a lot of difference because we're not dealing with massive files. But the size of the file can make a lot of difference because when you open up a file and then you read all the data from that file into your program, you are taking up space in RAM. So if you have a file that is gigabytes big and you read that whole file in to a program, your program is going to be taking up gigabytes worth of RAM. So you need to make sure you have enough resources on the system to actually read that file. So the size, as a programmer, you can go out and say, whoa, wait a minute, this is way too big, so I'm going to do this in chunks. I'm only going to take a part of the file and do it, and another part of the file and do it, or I'm going to have to find some other file management. Um, and where it sits on disk. The location on the disk, that's how you get to the file, so you have to know the location on disk. These properties are generally called metadata, and what Python gives you is a file object. When you're, when you're accessing the file, when you're going out and say, hey, Python, give me this file, it gives you back a file object that has this information in it, and it has the ability to go in and get information out of the file or put information into the file. So let's get to it. We're going to open a file. That is the first thing you do with every file, um, whether or not you are going to read it, write it, append it, you have to open it. And that gives you the, the file object. So how do I open a file? I open a file with the open function. That's the total. Um, I have a variable. You know, it's a variable. It's on the left-hand side of an equal sign. This is going to be my file object. My file object is going to create, is going to store the file metadata, and it's going to give me my doorway into that file. So I have a function, it's called open, it's provided by Python, and it, it opens a doorway. That's what it does, it just swings that door open. Now it doesn't go out and get anything from the file. Open just opens the door, that's all it does. And then I have the name of the file itself. Now, this could be a fully qualified name, and by that I mean the full directory path, or it could be just the name of a file. If it's just the name of a file, like this is, it's expected to be in the same directory as your running program. So most files that you will use will have a fully qualified path, or there will be some other way to get to that information. Maybe there's metadata outside of the program. 
But for everything we're doing in this class tonight, we are dealing with files that are going to be in the same directory as my running Python program. And then we have a mode because opening a file isn't just about opening a file. Opening a file also tells you what you want to do once you've opened that door. Am I going to be throwing data into this file? Or am I going to be reading data from the file? Or am I going to be doing both? Or am I going to be appending to the file? Because write and append are different. R is read only. We're just going to read data from the file. Write is we're going to only write. We're never going to read. So write will actually overwrite everything in a file. So be careful if you don't want to override everything in the file. Append opens a file, does not overwrite everything, just adds new data to the bottom of the file. And B is for binary, and that, it, that basically says whether you're going to read it or write it binary. And you can combine the modes. So you can do a read-write mode. So you're going to get data from it, and you're going to write data to it, and that means it's not going to overwrite all the data. But this is the first thing you have to do. Whatever you're going to do with a file, you have to start by opening the file. And then, and I'm going to harp on this through the entire hour, you are going to have to always close a file. When I open a file, I take a resource from the system because there are only so many file opens you can do because every operating system has a type of file descriptor and there are only a limited number of them allowed. So I have to close it to return the resources to the system. So always close your file. Okay, so if a file already exists in a location specified, Python will open it. If it doesn't exist, then Python will create it when, it, when you're using W or R, when you're using read or write. And always remember to close. You're going to see that thing on just about every slide. Um, my, it's important to know that my file is not the contents of the file. It is simply a doorway into the file. So how do I get data out of the file? Well, I can read it. So I use that file object, and I, um, I say read. Read is a function. It's a function provided by Python that can only be used from a file object. And it's used to get data from a file. And then I'm going to put that data someplace. So in this case, I have Meister. Everything in Python is a string when it comes from external, including from a file. Um, and so I'm just going to set it equal to the value. So in, in this case, I'm reading it. And I'm reading it as the whole thing. I'm just saying get everything from the file. And what you'll see here is that this is a text file with a new line, a slash n as a new line, with two lines. So what it's going to do is it's going to get everything as a string, and it's going to put it back into the string. So that's one way to read data from a file. That's the quickest, the easiest way. But it's kind of what do you want to do with the data afterwards? Because part of storing data in a file means it's important enough to keep around. And if it's important enough to keep around, that means you're probably going to be doing some processing with it. So close your file. Always close your file. OK, so this is, we're going to read a file as a list. Last time we were just getting it, last slide, we're just getting everything from that file. This slide, what we're doing is we're reading the contents of a file as a list with the separator being the new line. Well, this is not hard because Python gives me a function called read lines. That is the only job of this function. It is to read things from a file and put them into a list. And that's what this will do. And we'll go out and look at read.py in just a second. So that's what read lines does. It, it, it puts it into a list, which makes it easier for you to handle it. So let's go out, and we're going to take a look at a little code here for a second. 
and let's see, it's read.py. So this is just a really simple, oh, let me make it bigger. Here we go. This is just a very, very simple file, okay? I have a file called manylines.txt. You can see that here, okay? And this is all that manylines.txt has. It has four lines in it. And I am going to open the file. I'm going to read the lines from the file, and I'm going to close the file. So let's see what I get when I debug this. So let's do this. Um, come on. Uh, where is it? I know it's here somewhere. Sorry about that. Okay. So let's do a little debugging. And look at our variables. Well, right now I have nothing. So I step over. And if I, and I apologize again for not being able to, um, to make this bigger. Yeah. My file, you'll see this text.io wrapper. That is the, the file object. And that file object contains some metadata. Okay, we have a buffer, and I'll explain buffers in a bit. Um, it's not closed. We have the encoding, UTF-8, ASCII. Sometimes it can be other encoding systems. Um, and then we have that it's mode. You can always see the mode, the name. Um, and so, and then the protected attributes, the chunk size, and finalizing. So this is the metadata of a file. And you always want to... Um, you always want to remember that that's there. It won't do a lot with it in this class, but please remember that it's there. So I am now going to read the lines from a file. And now I have this um, array, this list. Now you'll notice on this list, and we can see it up here, is that it didn't get rid of the new line character. So if you're going to use this and you only want line one, line two, if you don't want those new lines, you're going to have to strip them after you read them in. And so then I'm just going to print out what I just showed you, and I'm going to, of course, close my file. So that is reading them. Um, sorry about that. That is reading them into a structure, because a list is a data structure, so you're reading them into a data structure. And that's going to be a little bit important because you're going to have to do that in a lab. Okay, so line by line. So maybe I just want to read, I don't want to do read lines because I don't want that new line. That new line's a pain, I don't want to have to strip it. Read lines doesn't do exactly what I want, so I want to do something different. So I'm going to, I've got my open, and now I'm just going to use a for loop. And the nice thing about this is we have four line in my file. We know what a for loop looks like. We have done for loops for a couple of weeks now. And I can use the for in convention to, on a file just like I can use it on a list. So that makes this really, really easy. I'm not learning a lot of new stuff to get my stuff from a file. I can use for and in. And in the way this reads is it's for line. Line is just a variable. It's just a name. I could have named it Fred, but I chose line because that was more meaningful to me. In my file. And what am I going to do with every line in the file? Well, those are the lines in the file. And I'm just going to print the line. So the first line is going to come out, and it's going to print, this is a text file. And then I'm going to go back up to the for loop, just like we normally would. And line is going to be with two lines. So I just used a for loop, and I could use this on any file. And it could be a much, much bigger file. Um, 
So that's the way to read it line by line without having to worry about those pesky new lines. So let me see. I think, yeah, read each line. So let's go look at read each line. Okay, so this is my read each line, and I have my many lines.txt, which is what I was using before. And I'm going to go through, and I'm going to read it with this for loop. So let's do this, and we will set the config, edit the configuration for running again. And where is it? Read each line. Okay, so I'm just going to debug this. I successfully opened my file. Um, oh, it still gave me the new line. I'm sorry. My bad. Don't know what I was thinking about. So in the console, we get line one and line two and line three and line four. So I can go through it line by line. Well, why is this important? Well, it's important because maybe I don't want to read every single line in the file. Maybe I'm looking for a specific line, and once I get to that line, I can just stop. So I can do processing inside the for loop just like I would do any other processing on anything else inside the for loop because it's just a string. We're going to finish it just so we can see the last line put out. And then uh, let's go to this one. OK. So closing a file. I know I said a lot about close already, but I'm going to say a little bit more. Um, a file descriptor or file object, more, more correctly, is a system resource, and there are only so many of them on any file system. Now, I can't tell you how many of them there are on a file system, but they are a limited resource. As a limited resource, you need to make sure that you manage your resource as well. Each time you open a file, you get that file object. Return will close returns it to the system so somebody else can use it. Um, and close writes any changes you've made to the file, because we're going to talk about making changes here in just a minute. Um, when you close it, the file object is no longer available. So you've shut the door. You open the door with the open function. When you close, you close that door. Um, so you cannot use that file object anymore. Even if you have it hanging around, if you try and use it, you're going to get an exception. Always close a file. OK, so now we're going to talk about writing to a file. We learned about how to read, and now we're going to learn about how to write. So I have an empty file, OK, and I've got this little buffer thing here. My empty file has nothing in it. In fact, when I do the open, if there was an empty file, if there was anything in my empty file, it would have gone away. Excuse me. Um, so be careful with write. Be careful with write mode because you will erase the file, basically. If you want to read and write to a file, you want to have your mode as RW because you can combine the modes. So I've opened a file. And I'm going to write line one. But you'll notice that line one doesn't actually go to the file. It goes to this buffer. Every file operation um, goes through a buffer. Even the read ones do, but they're not as, um, unless you're dealing with really, really big, big files, you don't have to worry about the buffer size. With writing, it's a little different. And it's not based on size because I'm not, if, if I don't close this file or do something else to force that data out of the buffer, then what will happen is I'm going to lose the data and it's not going to go into my file. So we have to understand that we're not just managing, we're not just, we don't have just this one connection to the file. We have a connection to a buffer and then the buffer has the connection to the file. 
So if you see file, my file dot right, I've got my file dot right, and I didn't put this in there, but right is a function, and it's used on the file object, and its sole purpose is to write data to a file. Now you'll also now, now see here that line one has a new line after it. Nothing is going to add a new line to my to my file unless I do it. There's no magic there. So right now everything is sitting in the buffer. And, but I want it to get to my file. And the way I do that is to close the file. When I close the file, Python flushes the buffer into the file and closes the file. So if I want to see this in action, and by the way, let me know if you guys have any questions or if I'm going too fast. I don't see any questions, so that's good. Um, so let's take a look at write. Where's write? Write.py. Just, just what you saw, it's a very simple um, function to write. Now you'll notice that my empty file does not exist over here. It just doesn't. And that's okay, because I'm going to show you what happens when I um, create it initially, because that's what this write will do. And then once I'm going to run it again and show you what happens, because it's going to get rid of it the second time, even if there's a file there. And I'm just trying to impress upon you guys that you have to be careful with write, because it will erase your data. So I'm here, I open my empty file.txt, so what do I have? I haven't written it to disk, it is not here yet, yes, okie dokie. So the data in the working memory and then and when you close the file it commits the data to permanent storage. That's completely, that's absolutely correct Joseph, very good. Um, oops. So let's go back here. Um, so you'll notice that my empty file doesn't exist over here in my little left hand corner. It doesn't exist yet because I haven't actually written anything to it. So I haven't told the operating system to create the file. All I've done is gotten a file object. And I know that because I go down here and I have my file object. Now, if you look at this file object, you see this buffer, okay? This is that memory space. This is that temporary intermediate place that I'm going to write things to until I close the file. Now, on some operating systems, it may actually flush that buffer for you when the buffer gets full enough. But the question you have to ask yourself as a programmer is, do I want to leave it to the operating system to decide what needs to happen in my program? And generally that answer is no, you don't. You want to be the one who's telling the operating system what to do, not hoping that the operating system will do something for you. So, I still don't have uh, my my empty file txt, but I've just said write line one, and I'm going to write line two again, and I still don't have my empty file txt on the left hand side, and now I'm going to close, and where did it go? My empty file txt is here, and if I open it up, I can see I have line one and line two in it. So if I do this. actually. We'll just put that there. And now I'm going to do this again. And I'm going to debug it. I'm going to step over it. And I'm going to do this, this, and close it. And I'll have a different my empty file dot text. And actually what I'll do here is I'll just change this to so it's a little bit clearer. And I'll run it, and my empty file.txt has that information in it. 
So that is what writing does. Writing overwrites the file. And if you want it to, if the file doesn't already exist, it's going to create a new one. Um, okay. So now, how do we write it before we close it? Let's say I've got a lot of really big data. I got lots of data. I got millions of lines of data. And I want to write that data occasionally to a file because I don't, I think I'm going to overflow the buffer and I don't want to leave it to the operating system and plenty of really good reasons why you don't want to just sometimes hope that the right thing's going to happen. Again, it's the difference between you telling the operating system what to do and the operating system telling you what to do. So I'm going to open my big file.txt. I get my buffer. I'm going to say four counter in range 100. Now, when I started this, I was like, oh, I'm going to do a million. But then I was like, it's going to take a long time for me to show that on a program. And it's just not worth it. So we're just going to assume right now that 100 is a big file. And I'm going to write big file into my big file. And that's, of course, going to go to the buffer. And then I'm going to go back up. Whoops, went to the wrong place. Sorry about that. And I'm basically going to say here, if counter is modulo 10, which means it's evenly divisible by 10 and there is no remainder, then I'm going to flush. So for every 10 lines, I'm going to flush. Sorry, i got to change that. And what my file.flush does is it goes and it says write it to the actual file, store it on disk. And then I'm going to close. And at that point, it's going to take whatever might be left in the buffer and write it to file. Now, um, oh, I just had a thought. I'm sorry. So I can't remember. I'm sorry. I was going to say something important, and I lost it. If it was really important, it'll show back up in my brain. Um, so that's what you can do to clear the buffer intermittently um, before you close. Now, you probably won't have to do that in this class, but it's important to understand that there are ways to do that. So if we want to look at that real quick, uh, what was that? Flush. Flush.py, exact same code you just saw, nothing different. And I'm just going to run this. And we're going to see that it's going to write to my big file. Is my big file there? No, my big file is not there. So edit. Flush. So I'm just going to run this. I'll have it on the console. And we'll see that now I have my big file.txt. It's got 100 lines in it. And you will see each time there was a flushing, it's because I hit that line of code, which means it then flushed to disk. Now, why is that important? One of the re this is what I was going to say. One of the reasons flushing is important is because sometimes you might have an error in your program, and maybe your program dies. Maybe something bad happens. If you are flushing intermittently, you are giving yourself the best chance possible to recover any data if something catastrophic has happened to your program. That is a very good reason to flush, and it helps you manage. So you're not completely out in the cold if, you know, you've written thousands of lines and it's all sitting in your buffer and then all of a sudden your program dies. Because the buffer is in RAM, and when your program goes away, anything it and anything in it go away. The only way it's stored is if it's in the file. So managing a file with width. So we've seen we've seen a for loop, but now we have a new keyword, and that keyword is called width. 
with basically is a keyword. It tells Python that it's going to loop over a file and it manages the filing handling for you. So with means you don't have to explicitly close. Once you are out of a with loop, Python will automatically close the file and return any resources to the system and which will also mean that it flushes the buffer. So with is very a very handy tool and I use it all the time when I'm dealing with files in Python. Now it's the keyword and then the next thing that happens is it's going to be an open function call. So in this case I'm going to open my text file.txt and I'm going to say as my file. So as is just giving it the variable. After as is another keyword that goes along with with and my file is just a variable name, but that's where the file object is going to be placed. So before I had my file equal open, now I will have with open my text file as my file. So my file is just the variable. And then I can just read a line, or I can write a line, or I can do all kinds of things. So I can print my line here. And then I can, where is it going? Okay, then I can print my line here. And when I'm done, it closed automatically. With indicates a loop over a file. So understand that with is a specific type of loop that is used with files. Okay. With will process the file until it reaches the end of the file. And when it reaches the end of the file, it stops. So, and anything, this is just like a loop. So anything that happens in the scope of the loop is not accessible outside of the loop unless you define a variable to hold it that is outside the loop. So let's go and do a little more code here. We have with.py. And this is my many lines.txt file. And I'm going to open it for reading. And I'm just going to say as f, because I got lazy when I was writing it. And then we're going to have the line of the file. I'm going to read lines. And I'm going to print it. Um, I don't know what I'm doing the second for loop here. For, for line in fl print line. I don't know why I did that. Let me look. Let's see if that makes any sense at all. And if not, we'll just delete it and pretend it wasn't there. Okay. With. Let's see what happens. Okay. Oh, okay. That's what I did. So I read the line from the file. And you will see that I got a list. That's what I got there. I got with the read line I read in just the list of lines and then I printed out what I got for the line and then I just printed out each element in the line of or sorry in the I printed each element out in the list from the file and this is just a, a quick short example now we're going to go through some longer examples in a few minutes because we're going to deal with comma separated value files and I'm going to go through a couple of examples one that does not have to do with a function that will hopefully help you with the labs because the labs in this in this section are kind of like mini projects. They're pretty big. So let's go back. And we're going to talk a little bit more about working with the operating system just because there's a couple of things you want to know. Um, there's actually a lot you want to know, but there's only a couple things we're going to cover in this class. Um, and I said it before, Python neutralizes the difference between operating systems. So that the things, um, a well-written Python script can run on any operating system with the Python um, interpreter on it. So we also have modules. And I'll get to what we're going to do in a second. Um, and modules are really talked about in 1.7. And I touched on them a little bit then. And I'm going to touch on them a little bit more now. 
A module is just a library of code that oftentimes someone else has written. Not always, because you can write your own modules. But there are all kinds of modules out there for all kinds of things. So don't necessarily start writing something. Go out and look for it, especially if it's open source. Um, and maybe not. I mean, there's some great things that aren't open source. But modules or libraries are like going into a library and pulling out a book and using that book. Um, there are There's a specific module to interact with the operating system, and it's called OS. Now, down here are a couple of links for dealing with Python modules. And uh, sorry, the first one is for dealing with the OS module. And the second one is just modules in general. OK, so what do I do with a module? Well, why am I talking about the OS module? I'm talking about the OS module because Linux and Windows slashes are different. You've got a backslash, you've got a forward slash, and they do things differently. Windows has a C colon, Linux doesn't, it has a slash. So how do you deal with this when you're writing a program that you want to run on Linux and Windows? Well, you use the OS and the path separator because the OS module will take care of that for you. So I have import. Import is a keyword. It tells Python to go out and get the code that is external to the script. I have the name. In this case, it's OS. I'm going to create a file path. So in this case, I have os.join. Join is not like joining a list. Join in this case on the OS module basically says, given whatever operating system I'm on, and by the way, I don't have to know it, Put the right path separators in so this works on whatever operating system I'm using. And so there's Linux and Windows. And if it were, if it, the same code were running on Linux, it would do that. And if it were running on Windows, it would do that. So that's what uh, something like OS can give you. Now, we don't necessarily need this for lab, but it's important to understand that there are differences. Um, I know a lot of new programmers, you know, junior level programmers out there who end up scratching their head because they've only written code on a Windows machine and they can't figure out how to get it to run on a Linux machine and it's because the slashes are different. So understanding something like os.join and the other operating system functions can be extremely handy. So binary data. Most data in files is not text. It's not human readable, and that's what binary data is. Um, and a lot of, you know, imagery, movies, um, Microsoft Office files, audios, Keynote, they're all binary. If you open up that file in a text editor, it's going to look like gobbledygook because it is. It's not meant for humans to read. It's meant for a program that understands what that gobbledygook means. So that's what binary data is. So most things are in binary data. What do we do in Python to deal with binary data? Well, there's a couple things. Um, first of all, there's the B moniker, basically. And it says, treat this as byte. Treat this as non, um, yes. So treat this as a string of bytes and not as a string of characters because the bytes are the ones in the zeros. And then it's going to print my bytes and you can get the type of my bytes and that will be of type binary. But there's a lot more you can do. So we're going to go out here and look at something that's kind of not in the module. Because I think it's important to understand the process of doing this. So when I look at this, here's what I had. Bytes equal B. This is really bytes. Um, and then I print my bytes. So what? Well, it doesn't get us the whole way. And that kind of this is one of the things that bothers me about side books. They take you a little bit of the way there, but they don't take you all the way there. So the rest of this is about really writing a binary file. 
re really reading non-human writable data. Um, so you have to use, to, to do this properly, you need a module called struct. And struct basically it's provided by Python. It allows you to pack and unpack data that is binary. Um, and so what I have here is I have a string, and I'm going to pack the bytes, because that's what you have to do. You have to take a byte, you have to pack it based on a certain format, um, and then you can write it to the file. So in this case, I have an array, because I have to take each character individually. I have to get the ASCII or UDF-8 representation, because remember way back we talked with strings, we said every string has um, a numerical representation. Well, I have to get that numerical representation. So for every character, that's what I'm going to do. And I'm going to pack it. In this case, it is, um, there is big Indian and little Indian. And I'm not saying Indian, I'm saying E-N, not I-N. So little Indian and big Indian. And it's just the byte order. And then this is going to create hexadecimals. So I'm going to take the, the numeric equivalent of that character, and I'm going to make it a hexadecimal, and I'm going to tell it how to arrange the bytes, the zeros and ones. And then I'm just going to print packed, and I'm going to add it into my array, and then in a little bit I'm going to write it to my byte file, and I'm going to write it as binary. So WB rather than just W. And I'm just going to write everything into that file because I don't want it to go in as a list. I want it to go in as individual binary care, binary values. And then I'm going to close the file. So let's um, just run this. And let me, let me do this. And uh, flush. Where is it? Bytes. Okay, so this is the first stuff I had up here, just the, you know, printing it in bytes, and we can see that it's of class bytes, and when I print it out, it's got a B in front of it, so the moniker says, hey, this is binary. But I really want to figure out how to pack my bytes and store it as byte code. So I'm going to, I've created an array, and then for each element in the counter, I'm going to use struct.pack, and I'm going to print out packed, and you will see down here, let me make that bigger, that this is in fact the byte code in hexadecimal. Um, and I'm going to do that for every single character. So let's just continue on. And you will see all of these different characters. And then I'm going to write it to my file. So I'm going to open my file for writing binary. And then I'm going to put each and every character in there. And then I'm going to close the file. And when I look at my byte file, you will see, and those aren't, you will see that those are um, not necessarily human readable. Now that's not as complex as it can get but I wanted to show you the next level of binary. Um, just because I felt it was important to introduce you guys to bro a few broader concepts at this point. Now, you're not going to need this for anything. It was just one of those things that I feel is kind of important. So, comma separated values. This is important for this week because you need to know this for Lab 7.8. Um, if you look at spreadsheet organization, they're all really comma separated value files. And all a CSV file is, is values separated by commas and new lines. Um, there is a CSV module for handling CSV files. You get it as part of Python, and um, it makes life very handy. So I have a file here called words, words.csv. And I have cat in the hat, hat in the hand. 
And what I want to make sure I do is I want to create a list of the words in this file, and but only I only want one of these words in a list. So if they're repeated, I don't want two values. I just want one hat. I don't want two hats. I just want one the. I don't want two thes. So I, how do I do that? Well, the first thing I'm going to do is import CSV. Because that's the module I know. This is a comma separated value file over here. And this is the module I know that I can use for comma separated value file. And I'm just going to create an empty list. I'm going to do with open words.csv as words. That's completely fine. This is just my loop, so I'm going to loop through the file. I'm going to do something with it. Well, what am I going to do? I am going to define a variable called content, and I'm going to use the reader function from the CSV module on any words. So I'm reading it as words, so any variable there. And delimiter equals comma, because this doesn't have to be a comma separated. I could do colon. I could do anything I want as the delimiter. So that's all the CSV reader is giving me. It's going to split this up. And then I can basically go through the content. So I'm going to go through the content, and this is in case there are multiple lines in the file. And I'm going to say for counter in range length of whatever's in the content. And then if the value row of counter is not already in the word list, then I'll put it in the word list. And then I'm done. So let's take a look at comma delimited real quick. Uh, is it comma delimited or comma separated? It's got to be comma separated. I did that wrong. Okay, so I have a words.csv file. This is cat in the hat, hat in the hand. So I just have a lot of words there, and I want to make sure that I don't duplicate my words. Whoops. What in the world? CSV. Okay. So let's give this a shot. We'll edit the configuration. And I'm just going to debug it. So I've successfully opened my file. If I go here to variables, I know I have my wrapper, and I know it's su successful because you know it tells me it's got the name of the file. And I've got my word list defined here, which is empty. So if I go through and I look at contents, content is actually not that string you saw in the file. Content is an object. It's a csv.reader object with all kinds of stuff in it. And to get at the stuff in it, you're going to have to do the in, for row in. And when I do that, you'll see that row is actually the information. It's actually just a list that comes out. That's the only way to get at that content. That content isn't the list. Content is a pointer or an object that contains that list. So when you're doing your module, to, when you're doing your lab with CSV, with the CSV reader, remember, this line is not going to get you exactly what you want. It's going to get you close, but it's not going to get you there. This is an object. This is, in fact, the data that you need. So that's why we're doing four counter in range len row. Okay? So then... I am going to, um, my counter is zero, so for each value, I'm going to check and say, hey, are you in the list? And so here I am at zero, so I'm just going to add cat, and then we can see the word list grow here. And I've got in, and I've got the, and I've got hat, so far so good. So here, 
I have the word hat again, and it's not going to go in there. I didn't add another word hat. I have the word in, and it's not going to go, and then I have hand, and I'm going to be done. So this is very, very related to what, very similar to what you're going to be doing in 7.8. So, um, yeah. So that's the CSV file. Now, you're going to have to learn how to read stuff into a dictionary. You're basically taking um, data. Here's the data. Oh, I didn't do that. Sorry, my, my order is off on this one. So we'll just do a lot of clicking. And then we'll talk about it. Yeah, my... My, okay, so I don't, I'm not reading anything because it was too much on this page. I'm not reading anything in from a file, but that doesn't matter because I just have a list here and we know how to get things out of a file into a list. We can use read lines, we can use the for loop and strip it of the new line. We can do whatever we want. So I've, I've skipped that part, and right now I just have contents, and I have name, Lisa, answer, 42, amount, 3.14. And I have to turn this into a dictionary, because for 7.9, that's what you're going to have to do. You're going to have to read data in from a file, you're going to have to turn a list into a dictionary, and then you're going to have to print things out, and you're going to have to put things out to the file again. Um, so I'm going to create an empty, oops. Hold on, back, back. I'm going to create an empty list called my dict. There we go. And then I am going to go through, there we go. I'm going to go through the contents. I'm going to go through contents. And I am going to basically, because I want name to be a key, and Lisa to be a value, and answer to be a key, and 42 to be a value, and amount to be a key, and 3.14 to be four to be a value, which is a pattern. All right, the, the, the first element is the key, the second element is the value. Key value, key value, key value. That's how it goes. So, I'm going to say, now this is, this is not, you know, one of the quick and easy, um, well, it is kind of easy, but you have to understand that you're going to be dealing with two elements from the list at one point in time instead of just one. So you need to make sure that you do that. And you'll notice that um, here, Basically, I want to make sure that the contents is not in the dictionary. So if counter plus one is, le is less than the length and counter modulo two is zero, which means it's not a remainder, so it means it's even, then um, as long as the, the, the key isn't already in the dictionary, I'm going to add it. I'm going to say my dict of contents of counter equal Contents of counter plus one. So it gets me the first element and then the second element. I'm going to go back up to the top of the loop and I'm going to do it again. And then I have it in a dictionary and I can just go through and I can print my dictionary out. So let's take a look at this code as well. And that was just a text file, but we're not going to do that right now. So here's just something called to dict. And this is pretty quick, so we'll just, and I know I'm going through this stuff fast, and I know I'm going over, and I apologize for that. Um, so let's just debug this quickly. So I'm in my for loop, and here's what's going to happen. Whoops, there's my step over. Okay, so I have counter, which is zero. I have, I'm adding to my dict, so I'm going to add 
name and then Lisa as the first key value pair. I'm going to increment it by 2. So counter equals plus equal 2. And, oh, I didn't need to do that. I should have gotten rid of that. Let me get rid of that line of code before I put that up there. That was wrong. Anyway, so I'm going to go through, and now I'm at counter of 2, and I'm going to add the next one, and then I'm at counter of, yeah. And then I'm going to add the next one, and then I'm done. And this is wrong. So let me take that out. Stop and we'll debug it again. Sorry for the confusion. Okay, so now counter is zero. I'm going to add it to my dictionary. Counter is now one, which is less than one plus, one plus counter is still less than the length of context, but it will not, um, modulo two will not return zero. So I'm going to go back up to the top of the loop, and then I'm going to add the next two. Here, go look at variables. And then I'm going to go back up to the top of the loop. And I'm going to add it again. And I'm done. Now, why do I have if counter is less than, sorry, if counter plus one is less than length? And that's because I'm always going to be accessing the next thing after counter. So I'm, if my counter is zero, I'm also going to be getting one. And I want to make sure I don't walk off the end of the list. So the way to do that is to always check your length before you access anything. And then I'm just going to go through and print out what's in the dictionary. Lisa, name Lisa, answer 42. And so this is kind of a good format to, to think about when you're looking at that particular lab. So let's, speaking of labs, let's go look at some labs. Um, so this is the pseudocode for the labs. This will be up on the YouTube page. There'll be links to this. So this is 7.8, which is our word frequencies, which is our CSV file. And this is similar to what we did in the CSV file example. Um, so we're going to set word list. We're going to um, get the input for the file name. We're going to set word list to an empty list. This is, uh, the, these two lines are really the width statement. So once it's open, where there are more lines in the CSV file, um, we're going to set the user file to the CSV file with the limiter comma. So this is our row and user file for index and length of row. If the value of row at index is not in the word list, then output the row and then append it. And this just shows you the list method. So this is very similar to what we looked at before. Now, 7.9 is almost like a project. You kind of got to treat it like a project, so you want to break it down into pieces. And even if you have to do this in PyCharm, and then put it back in Zybooks and check it, I would suggest doing that. Because this is a lot of code to write at one sitting without checking it. Um, so I've got, I'm going to have a file name that's input. I'm going to have, I'm going to set my user file to whatever, um, to opening that file. So I'm basically going to open the file and I'm going to read um, from the file. I'm going to create an empty dictionary. I'm going to create a show list and a split show list. So those are three empty things that I need to do. And this is just a comment that I put in there to help describe what's happening. So starting from the first item in the list, every other item in the list is a key, and every value in between is a value associated with the preceding key. This is very much like what we just did in to underscore dict.py. So I've got a temporary, I'm going to have a for loop. I'm going to have a temporary list so I can put things in my temporary list um, before I put them in to the real, into the dictionary. Um, I'm going to go through each individual item 
from the output list, which was all the lines in the user file. So this setup here is basically read lines. And then I have to convert the list object to an integer. Um, we know how to do that. We just use the int function. And I make sure if it's in it, it's going to remove the new line and it's going to append it. Else it's going to remove the new line and it's going to append it at 1 to the temp list. And then it's going to set my dict at list object to temp list. Then, that's part one. Part two, and there's another part to this, um, we're going to sort, because that's what we have to do. We have to sort everything, so set sorted my dict, and then sort the dictionary. That's what you're going to want to do. Um, you're going to sort it by keys, and you're going to populate a new dictionary called sorted underscore my dict. And then we're going to change from a dictionary to a list. So that's what we're going to do here. We're just going to go through um, the keys in my dictionary. So you need to do a dot keys right there. And then you're going to append um, the, my dict of x of keys to show list. So you just want to create that show list. So first you have show and frequency. And then you just want to create a list of shows. And um, and then you're going to, and it's a list of lists, so then you're just going to split it into a single list, and you're going to sort it. And then part three, this is why I said it's like a project. You're going to open an output.txt for writing, and for every key value pair in the sorted dictionary, you're going to convert the key to a string. You're going to separate it by colon space. And then you're going for every out, um, you're going to slice, basically. So this is the slicing. You're going to write what you have sliced to the file. So you're, you need to, these are all just string slicing that you're doing. And then you're going to close that file. And you're going to open up a second file called output underscore titles. And in the split list, so in the list that has everything that's a flat list, you're going to write the item and a new line to the file, and then once you're done, you're going to close that file. This, a lot, this lab is a lot of work. My suggestion is that you get the easier lab done first so you can get the most credit for it, and then start working on this one. And work on it slowly in PyCharm, okay? So you start with just this section. You read, because you can download, by the way, you can download these input files that PyCharm is, that Zybooks is giving you. You start out with section one, you do this and you get it working. Once that is working, you do this and you get it working. And then you do this one and you get it working and, the, and your lab will be completed and you can copy it into Zybooks. I would not recommend doing this in Zybooks from scratch. Um, I think that that is a recipe for frustration and a headache. So does anybody have any questions? Have I completely overwhelmed you with file stuff? Going once. Okay, yes, it is a lot. It is a whole lot that we have gone through tonight, Joseph. Um, and I'm trying to prepare you for going through these labs because the labs are a lot too. Um, so for any of my students that are here tonight, always reach out to me. Um, just send me an email. Yes, I know, it is a lot and you have to also hand in your project. Your project is a bigger amount of points. So my suggestion for maximizing points and taking as little risk as possible is finish your project. Then go back and do 7.8, do the smaller of the two labs. So, and then once you've done that, 
go give the bigger lab a try. If you don't, the labs are the same amount. You don't get more for doing a longer lab. Okay, they both weigh the exact same in Zybooks. So this is basically your, your, your maximizing your points. So to maximize your points, get that project done first. And then go back, do 7.8, knock it out, and then do what you can on 7.9. And I know for my class, um, I go out and I look. We're actually all all professors are supposed to look, and we are allowed to give partial credit. And I definitely look at 7.9 and see how much you've done, and give partial credit based on not just whether or not Zybook says it's work, but the work that you put into it. So, are there any other questions tonight? Going once, going twice. Okay, you guys have a great evening. I will hopefully have this up um, tomorrow night, and um, good luck. So I'm going to stop the recording.